Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. The Industrial Development Corporation released its results this week amid turmoil at many state-owned companies and concern over an IDC loan to a Gupta family-linked company. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss how the financier is seeking to navigate the turbulence. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. The IDC has announced two interventions designed to improve transparency and governance in this era of state capture. What are the details? Yeah, th th I think it is two fairly significant interventions. The first uh, and highest profile is that from now on the Industrial Development Corporation will publish the names of their clients, the people that benefit from the loans that the IDC disperses every year. And uh, up until this point, and as is tradition within the financial services sector, client confidentiality has been put placed at a premium. But I think under the sort of direction of the, the shareholder minister, in this case it's Economic Development Minister Ebron Patel, and the growing sensitivity, as you mentioned, around state capture, there's this view that because they're dealing with public money, although the IDC doesn't get any direct fiscal transfers, it's a self-sustaining uh, organization, it needs to be self-funding. Uh, because it's public money, there's a view that we should have more transparency around who their clients are. So from the 1st of April, those that want to do business with uh, uh, the RDC must be aware or will be made aware that their names will be published on the RDC website. At the moment, it's a fairly short list because it's only the clients uh, that were, have been signed up since the 1st of April. And we don't, it's not retrospective, so we can't go back and look at the full client list over this period where uh, state capture is arguably at, at its peak, you know, uh, I've been sort of since the 2010 period. But anyway, the, the, I think it's a, it's a positive move. There's going to be greater transparency, and it's really underpinned by this desire for greater integrity uh, at the institution and integrity in lending, and that uh, basically the public can raise questions where they feel that integrity is being breached. And the second one is really led by the board, and the board has this determined that uh, despite the fact that it draws its uh, ex non-executive directors from business, and obviously business people by their nature are looking f to do be active in the economy and may turn to the IDC as one of their funding sources, there's been a now prohibition from all non-executive directors from doing any business with the state and financier. So this is also a departure from the past. In the past, only executive uh, executives at the IDC were precluded from uh, doing any business directly with RDC. Now it also relates to their non-executive board members. So I think two fairly significant developments and it shows although there's a lot of unhappiness in the country around state capture and the fact that there's been a lack of action especially in terms of a judicial commission of inquiry as per the demand of the previous public protect protectors report uh, or, or a remedy um, uh, when it was published last year there, is, there are signs of movement uh, in, a, in a number of areas, and the IDC is, I suppose, at the forefront of trying to clean up and ensuring that, uh, that its integrity uh, is not breached. The IDC itself is in the crosshairs for a 2010 loan extended to Oak Bay for the purchase of the Shiva uranium mine. That's right. I mean, that, that uh, loan was about 250 um, million rand to um, the Gupta Link company, Oak Bay to buy a uranium asset out in the West Rand. Um, that, uh, you know, at the time, you must understand, I suppose, around this whole state capture thing, there were a lot of questions or eyebrows raised as to why the Gupta family was getting involved in uranium mining. Obviously, there was this huge push at the time, and I suppose the pressure will, will at some point also return uh, to build a nuclear, uh, new nuclear program at a fairly large scale. Uh, that is uh, currently, I'd say, off the agenda, one, because of the court intervention to show, showing that the process was entirely illegal. But also, I think the uh, energy economy dynamics have changed quite a lot with Eskom currently in surplus and with more, probably more importantly and fundamentally, ultimately, alternative sources to renewables coming down the cost curve quite dramatically, especially renewable energy. So the form that nuclear comes back uh, is going to be interesting. Um, uh, both in terms of process and in terms of whether it can really fit in to our future uh, uh, electricity economy and that we'll have to keep an eye on. But I think the loan itself uh, by the RDC has 
raise the number of questions. One, because of the nature of the asset being uh, uh, one that was really not a, a great asset. Um, why, why did IDC support that transaction? And two, the, the, in the end, the, the, cup, the Oak Bay company that received this loan is, is, is in, in quite a lot of difficulty itself. So now the capital amount of 250 or so uh, odd million, um, IDC says only 37 million of that is outstanding. But there's a whole lot of interest that has been accumulated since 2010 of a similar type quantity of around 250 million and that hasn't been paid. And you can again see there that the IDC is now elevated to have board, uh, non-executive directors involved in the engage engagements with Oak Bay because what has now subsequently happened is that <laughs> outstanding interest has been converted into shares in Oak Bay. Oak Bay was a listed entity on the JSC. It's since been delisted. There are a number of concerns around uh, whether they'll have banking partners in, uh, with the Bank of Baroda now withdrawing its services or in the process of withdrawing its service from Oak Bay. So there's a big risk for the IDC in terms of getting this money back. Uh, and uh, the, the indication we got from the CEO, Jeffrey Queno, is that they really want to get this settled, this engagement done with Oak Bay as soon as possible. In fact, he says if it could be done yesterday, that would be the best for them. Could we also look more generally at the outlook for the IDC and its role in the reindustrialization of the economy? Yeah, that's really fundamentally what the IDC is about. And if you look at our manufacturing statistics, they are dismal and the outlook doesn't look much better. And we keep talking in uh, industrialization or reindustrialization and the opposite seems to be happening. Now, there's a lot of headwinds for manufacturers, not least the political environment and the, um, not least the economic environment and the weak demand that that has generated. But also the po politics is weighing heavily on just about all sectors and, and the manufacturers are also finding it very, very difficult in this context. The IDC uh, is wanting to scale up its lending activity. This year it had approvals of over 15 billion rand, which is the, the record for them. However, well off the sort of target levels they had been set by their shareholder minister back in 2015, where they were really told to, to get to the sort of 20 billion a year type approval level, and also to close the gap between approvals and disbursements. This year, they only were able to manage disbursements of 11 billion rand, which was 3% down. So in terms of real money being injected into its client base, they were down. But in terms of approvals, they're up. And they've got commitments of about 33 billion rand that they haven't dispersed. So there's still quite a lot, to, long way to go. And it is a scale up from where they were. But <coughs> one of the reasons why they didn't get uh, the disbursements up to the level, or close to the level of approvals is the fact that uh, Eskom is no longer signing power purchase agreements and uh, they've got about 8 billion in commitments to renewable energy projects. So not all of that would have been dispersed last year, but some of that would have been dispersed and that would have closed the gap. But uh, th I think there's also been a, a, a sort of focus in the year, not only on getting more approvals and also on the Black Industrialist Program, there's been a massive scale up there and plans for even more in the current year. It's gone to about the four and a half billion rand level uh, with 83 transactions and they're looking to get to over 7 billion this year so there's a big focus on black industries but there's also I think been a focus on trying to ensure that the bad debt numbers or the, the that that sort of gets reined in so we've seen the impairments uh, to the, the to the business have sort of been reined back and that's quite an important signal especially in this difficult environment However, warnings were put out by uh, Jeffrey Quena that their client base is in distress. And in fact, they, can, they foresee that maybe distress type funding might be a big element of this year. They haven't put a figure to it. They were expecting it to be worse than it was last year. Um, but they say that, that poten potentially there's up to 20 billion in uh, distress funding out there that, that think could come forward. So we'll have to they have to pay attention to that as well as the impairments. But because th they, this, this, it's a balancing act for the DFI, in the sense they're wanting to give fairly favorable terms, especially to black industrialists and, and just generally getting act economic activity. But they are self-funding and they need to make sure that they don't uh, put good money off the bad. And I think that's the balancing act that they're having to do all the time. And then just coming back right back to the, what your first question around governance, Without that good governance, there's going to be always questions about good money off the bad. It's not going to be seen as just 
you know, taking risk and making mistakes, it's going to be seen. Or questions are going to be asked as to whether this wasn't related to corruption. So it's very important that they correct and they, they seem to be taking serious action to ensure the integrity of their lending is beyond reproach. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis.